<laughs> good, good. Uh, it's always a good day. Uh, the, there's a class called Physics of the Human Body that's taught in the other lecture hall right before this, and they're starting the physics of um, the eyeball and the optics of that. Uh, and the instructor likes to do optical illusions, but I end up performing them all because they're my stuff, so that's always fun. I like optical illusions. Today, we're going to, my goal is to cover uh, a little more thermal expansion, specifically with water and ice. And then chapter 16, starting with heat transfer, there's three methods, conduction, convection, and radiation. And that's what these demos are for. And then Friday, we can, if I didn't get through that, we can explain it more and apply it a little more for the rest of the chapter. Do you guys have any questions, though, before I get started? Oh, glad you asked. I don't know yet. I meant to check that this morning so I could announce it, um, and it got so busy, I haven't looked. So I don't know if 80% or more did it. Last I looked, it was like less than half when I sent that email out. So uh, I can, I'll check and let you know, of course, but I don't know yet because I for, didn't get around to doing it. What? Then I, I, I get, I, either way, I get lots of instructive feedback. That's my main purpose for doing it. I just want to encourage more feedback because I know students tend to not do it. If uh, less than 80% completed it, then nobody gets extra credit, as I explained several times. So, Okay. Water. There's a nice picture in your book I'm trying to recreate here. Volume of, of water and temperature. And let's see, zero degrees and 100 degrees. So, let's see. I'll just apologize right now. This won't be exactly to scale, but it's for concept, right? Uh, here something happens we know, and here something happens we know. But which has more volume, water or steam? Oh, I thought you'd be more confident. Sorry. <laughs> You what usually has a bigger volume, a liquid form or a gas form? Gas. It can expand. It's, it's that way with uh, water as well, water, H2O. So uh, it has some, over here where steam, water vapor. It has a, a big volume. It's, what's that do to its density? Decreases. It has a small, small uh, density. As the temperature decreases, what do you think happens to the volume? Yeah, it, it decreases. Until it gets to 100 degrees Celsius, and you know what happens, it turns into water. Do you know what we call that? It's, the, it's chapter 17, we're not covering, but feel free to read it. Correct, condensation. And at that point, it doesn't change temperature. Remember what temperature is? That, that tells us that for here somewhere, it converts back to water. But for, while it's changing phase, it's not changing temperature. That tells us the average translational kinetic energy is not changing. They're not speeding up or slowing down at that point. Energy is transferred from other forms in a phase change. But then it gets the water, and as the water uh, cools, it comes down to zero degrees. And then it's called, you know this one, when water turns to ice. Are you know, just sitting there going, oh, that's too easy, I'm not going to answer. Freezing. Freezing. 
<laughs> and at that point, ice expands. H2O expands, and so the volume goes back up. But again, it's a phase change, so the temperature is not changing. And what do you think happens to ice as it gets colder? Anything? So you know, one vote for, yeah, it doesn't change size. Any votes that it would expand further or get smaller? You think it would keep getting bigger? So we got one vote for big, two votes for bigger, one for staying put. Anybody think it will get smaller? This tells me too. I can tell now. You had, nobody's read the book because it was right there. It is. It gets smaller like nearly everything else. Uh, so in general, gases, liquids, and solids get smaller when they lower their temperature. But water is one of those weird ones. Uh, H2O is one of those weird ones where when it goes from water to ice, it goes in a different direction than most things. It expands when it becomes ice. But once it's ice, if it keeps getting colder, it'll, it'll get smaller and, and increase its density. The cool part, and the reason we're grateful for this, is what happens right here. So let me blow that graph up. Temperature in Celsius, volume again. And let's do 4, 8, 12, 16. Zero. So right at that spot, the, the volume does this. So as water is coming down in temperature, it's de it's volume smaller, so it's increasing its density until it gets to 4 degrees Celsius. Right there. It peaks. It won't get any smaller. But it happens at 4 degrees. At that point, it starts freezing some of the molecules. And they start bloating the water. Because ice expands, and so they take up a little more space. But there's a mix, kind of, of ice crystals and water here. At zero, it's all frozen. And it expands. That, that zero, that's coming back over to here. Once it gets to zero, it all turns to ice. And now it's all taking up a lot more space. But right before that, it actually has an increase in density. Does it make sense so far? You're like, so what? <laughs> Can anybody tell me a so what? One, one reason we're really grateful that this happens? Correct. Yeah, that's the best example I can think of. Because of that, lakes don't freeze entirely. What happens is the, uh, the air temperature cools the water on the surface, right? And it lowers its temperature. What happens to its density then? It increases. And things that are more dense float or sink? More dense, they'll sink. So the cold water goes to the bottom. The warmer water will come back up top. Well, that water on the top cools. And what's it do? Sinks. And the most dense water is at 4 degrees. So the lake won't freeze over until at least all of the water is at 4 degrees. So something you can automatically know that if you see a frozen lake, the top's frozen, you, you know that all the water underneath it must be 4 degrees Celsius. All the water below it. Because it's cooling, it's cooling, it's cooling, and it drops. And the other stuff cools and it drops. But eventually it all becomes 4 degrees Celsius, right? If it gets any colder, the stuff on the top can get colder, but what's it do? It becomes less dense. And so it doesn't sink. It stays on the top and keeps getting colder until it freezes and turns to ice. And fish are very grateful for that. <laughs> Otherwise, they would just all freeze solid every year and we'd lose them every season. 
Uh, my daughter and I drove, we were up in the Uintas this last weekend and saw a big frozen over lake and she'd never walked on one. So I said, well, today's the day. So we went out and saw some ice fishermen. You know, they cut the little holes and the ice was, you know, that thick on the top. And I remembered I was doing this lecture and of course, you know, the geek in me said, ah, oh, yes. All the water below us is four degrees Celsius. Because it got more dense and sunk before the top could freeze. And when it froze, it became less dense. And once it all became ice, it was really less dense. And that's why ice floats. I always found it funny with drinks. Should have brought one. You fill up your drink, and then you put the ice in. And it, it's to cool it, right? But when people have straws, where's the straw usually go? To the bottom. So you're, you're drinking the warmer liquid. The ice is on the top until it's had a chance to uh, convect, con tr transfer heat, and cool it all down. So if you're drinking a beverage with ice in it, the ice floats because it's less dense. But the straw grabs the stuff down here. So if you want it cold, get rid of the straw or move the straw up. <laughs> Something to think about next party you're at. You can look, remember back to what your instru physics instructor said. And go, boy, that's so cool. Okay, I know. So something to realize, <coughs> excuse me, if you have H2O at 4 degrees Celsius and you heat it up, what happens to it? What? It gets bigger. It expands. Its density decreases if you heat it up. So what happens if you cool it down? it still gets bigger. That's the lowest point at 4 degrees Celsius. Some people get confused. Oh, it must go, if it goes bigger on one side, it must get colder, smaller the other way. Not if it starts at 4, because that's the, that's the bottom. That's the most dense H2O gets. Because water expands, I mean, ice expands when it freezes, uh, it can cause damage. Uh, pipes, if you or a water bottle, if you fill this all the way up with water or in your pipe, you don't let it drain, and it freezes. The ice wants to expand and take up more space, but the pipe won't let it. So what happens? It bursts, it breaks. There's a lot of force. All that expansion is over a big area, it creates a big pressure. Or you can think of it, it exerts a certain pressure over a big area that creates a big force. That's probably more accurate. And you can break pipes that way. And it seems to happen every winter. Somebody's pipes are too exposed. They lose too much heat. The water freezes completely to ice. And they burst. Not good. So remember that ice expands. And it can save you lots of money. Any questions about that? From four, it, they both get less dense from this point. Here, it's water. And so when you add heat, let's think about it. This, this, this will be good for you. What happens to those molecules, the H2O? These can represent H2O. They expand, but physically, individually, if you increase the temperature, you're increasing their average translational kinetic energy, right? So they're starting to translate. Move around. And what's that do? They run into each other. And they hit each other and have collisions and transfer momentum and energy. And they bounce apart and they expand. Yeah? Um, if you get water hotter than 100 degrees Celsius without it turning into like a pressure heat? Yes, you can. A pressure cooker does that. This is all true at what we call standard pressure, atmospheric pressure, what we're used to. But if you change the pressure that this is under by either increasing it or decreasing it, you can change when these phase changes occur. They can occur at different temperatures. For example, here in Utah, we're not at sea level, standard atmospheric pressure of 15 pounds per square inch. We're at about 12 and a half pounds, less pressure. Remember why? Because we're higher up. There's less air above us. So the pressure's less. 
And it describes this really well in the next chapter. We won't cover, but you can read it about boiling and evaporation. But the air is pushing down on the water, right? And the water is sitting there going... If one of them has enough energy off the surface, it can escape. But the air pressure is pushing back down on it. If you're not pushing down as hard, it's easier to escape, isn't it? So here, water can boil below 100 degrees Celsius because we're under less pressure. A pressure cooker would increase that and say, no, no. And so you have to get it hotter before it can boil and have that phase change. And that pressure cookers allow you to get your food hotter then, which cooks it quicker. That's the point of a pressure cooker. Increase the pressure to change that phase change. Change that phase change. That's good. <laughs> Thus, it cooks at a hotter temperature. So here in Salt Lake, when things boil, you boil your egg, it's actually boiling at a less lower temperature than it would on the beach. So it might take a little longer to cook, even though in both cases we're boiling. But they're boiling at different temperatures. Cool, huh? So back to ice expanding. That's what they do. And as they get hotter and hotter, they move around more and more and expand. In here, though, there's a competition. As the temperature decreases, that's causing them to not move around as fast, correct? So they slow down. That would cause it to contract. But the main reason ice expands is because there's a better picture in your book. Here's water molecules. But ice, they form hexagons, which take up more space, the crystal structure. And that's why they expand. So as those start to form, it takes up more space. And that wins and expands. And as they all freeze, they all take up a lot more space, relatively speaking. So in this regime, you got both things going on. There's kind of a water ice slushy. Might help you remember it. So let's transfer some heat. There's three methods. Conductions, number one. Write it down. Heat transfer, remember that? That's Q. And the first method is conduction. Second, convection. And third, radiation. And a lot of people already know what these are. We'll just apply it, apply it to our physics. Conduction, I bet you somebody in here knows what that is. How does heat transfer? What, what's the method there? Good, you remember the electrons collide, because that's usually what's freer in an atom. They bump into each other. So this guy's electrons bump into this guy's electrons and impart energy. So if um, this has wood and metal, if I heat the metal up, it gets hot. And those hot atoms bump into their neighbors and cause them to start moving faster. So they increase their temperature. And then they run into the paper and the, and the wood and try to transfer the heat that way. So conduction is from particle to particle within the same material or direct contact of two different materials. You, you heat one up, they start moving faster, and they bump into their friends, their neighbors, Cause their temperature to increase. That's all there is to conduction. My favorite example is you all have it um, the metal armrest on your chair and the wood. Metal and wood. Touch them and tell me which one's colder. Metal feels colder, doesn't it? Think about it. They're at the same temperature. They've been in the room a long time, so they've, they've had time to interact with the air and all equilibrate and come to the same temperature. Do you believe me? We can measure them. I didn't bring a thermometer in. But does that make sense? So why does this one feel colder? More heat is being transferred from your hand to the metal. More heat is being transferred from my hand to the metal. So then it, it feels cold. 
So it feels colder. Because we receive more of the cold. Because we receive more of the cold. Do you want to add to that? No, that, that was very good. That's correct. Do you remember there were three factors that cause heat to transfer or affect it? A change in temperature. The greater the change, the faster, the more heat flows. Uh, mass. If you have more of the material, it's going to take longer to heat it up. It'll take more heat to get to the same temperature. And the third one was called specific heat capacity. And another term for it is C, another phrase term for it, thermal inertia. Good. Resistance to changing its temperature. Which has the lower specific heat capacity? Metal. So when we you touch it, you're the same same temperature, same temperature, but we're hotter than it, so heat flows from us to it. So the temperature change is the same, but this one has a greater change in its temperature with the heat that's flowing from me because it has less thermal resistance, thermal inertia. Does that make sense? But that's that heat is transferring through conduction, physical contact. Particle to particle. The hot particles in my hand bombard that, and heat is transferred. Another fun way to do it is this wood and metal. You can hold wood. Think of your wood handles on your uh, cookware. And you can heat the, the metal. You can get it nice and toasty. And yet, I don't feel a difference yet in my hand. Metal's a good conductor, and so it's conducting down to the paper. It wasn't as obvious today, but at the top, it's starting to be fringed. Let me make it more obvious. I'm going to burn the paper right on the, that's covering the um, wood and the metal. Ready? Well, not the tape. <laughs> Who's getting burnt more? The paper covering the wood. And this is conduction. It's not conducting this way well at all because wood's a poor conductor of heat. Its, it's electrons aren't as free to move around. So it, it takes more energy to change its temperature, the wood. Thus, the paper takes the energy and it gets burnt there. But here, the metal absorbs the energy the heat transfer, and so the paper doesn't get near as burnt there because the heat's going more into the metal. Eventually, the paper would burn on both, and so would the wood, but it takes more, different amounts of heat, and that's through conduction. And because we have it, super hot, we acquired a piece of the Columbia Space Shuttle. This is the same material that they used on the tiles of the Space Shuttle. This one didn't actually go into space, but it's made mostly up of air. It's a bunch of silicon fibers that sandwich air, and air is a terrible conductor of heat. And so I can uh, let me hold it. This might look cooler with the lights off. Same idea with that. This is all the same material instead of different materials. We got re-entry here. You can make it glow orange. It's extremely hot, it's many hundreds of degrees Celsius on that corner. But where I'm holding it, room temperature. It's a very poor conductor of heat through it. That's because it's mostly made of air, and air is a terrible conductor of heat. And that's why they make the, the tiles out of this for the shuttles, or they did. Yeah, they stopped making them.
But I think it's amazing. Just inches away of something I'm touching can be hundreds of degrees Celsius, but it doesn't conduct through it. It's terrible. Impressive. Since that's really hot, I have a fire brick. I'll set that on while it cools. Uh, any questions about conduction? Well, I got one for you then. What if you stick your hand in an oven that's really hot? It's, it's come up to temperature. Everything inside there is the same temperature. Open the door and stick your hand in. Do you get burnt? When do you get burnt? If you touch the metal. But the air is the same temperature as the metal. So why don't you get burnt when you just stick it inside? Because air is a poor conductor of heat. It doesn't allow that energy to transfer out of it quickly. It has a, a different specific heat capacity than metal. Metal, it'll transfer out quickly. And so the, the heat from the hot metal will go into your cold hand fast and you burn yourself. Convection. That has to do with uh, fluid flow. Air, water, blood, glycerin, maple syrup. That one, it's not particle to particle like conduction, but the particles themselves move and take, transfer the energy with them. <coughs> it's like a lava lamp. That's why I have it running. Who has a lava lamp? Only one? Oh, okay, more of you, more of you than I could see at first there. I was going to be disappointed. What it does is it's just a light bulb at the bottom that radiates heat. We'll get to that. To the fluid at the bottom in the, in the goo. And it heats up. Because they're in contact, so conduction, particle to particle. But when that goo gets hot, what do you think happens to its density? It lessens. It expands, decreases its density. And if you have it balanced just so in a, in a proper fluid, when it lessens its density, it can start to float. When it comes up here, it's farther from the heat source. So what happens? It cools contracts, becomes more dense, sinks. Heats back up through conduction, decreases its density, floats to the top. And this flow of fluid, because the blobs are doing it and so is the liquid, they get hot, become less dense and rise. The cold comes in to take its place. Then it heats up and it goes up and that fluid convection cell is another form of heat transfer. But see, the fluids themselves are moving. It's like a, they call it a radiator in your house. Those things against the wall, the older houses, where the water throws through and they're hot. Well, what do they do? It's bad that they call them a radiator, actually, because they do not heat your room up through radiation. What they do is heat the air up next to them through conduction, because they're in contact with it. But then that hot air rises and takes the energy with it. The cold air sinks, comes next to the uh, radiator, heats up, and it rises. And now you have convection heating your room. Here's an example. I have a tube full of water here, and I need to light my candle. on that end, and that's going to heat the water next to it, and it's going to start to rise up this side of the tube, the right side. The colder will sink and move over, and we should get a convection flow in here. Since we can't see clear water, I'll add some food coloring. Let's give it a chance to heat up and get that moving. Meanwhile, let's do the same thing over here. Let's heat up the air at the bottom of this tube. Hot air rises, cold air 
contracts and sinks down, takes its place. And we have convection through this chimney, don't we? Would you like to see it? There's some paper bits. Let me just chuck them in the bottom. And they fly out the top. They ride the hot air that's going up. Again. So it helped to visualize the convection going on. So eventually this would heat up the room. If we close things off, all the hot air would go up, cold air would come down over here, heat up, and eventually it would help heat up this room. Let's see if this is gone enough. Let's add some red for the utes, right? So if I put it in this side, it should sink as it's doing. The fun should happen when it gets down here. Will it just stay put? Of course not. Sorry, video people. So we are seeing motion that way, but some people still aren't convinced. Maybe it's just, you know, sliding down to the bottom. So the real test will be when it gets over here. Can it go uphill? This one's not as exciting as that one, I know. A larger flame would speed it up and break the glass. Unfortunately, this glass is not Pyrex. There we go. Uh, so it would uh, cause the glass to expand too quickly, cause stress in it, and it would fracture and break. That's what happened to the first one. <laughs> but you can see it does work. It comes up, and we are getting convection. That's what it is. Uh, da, 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 da. This is like a space heater, coils of wire. I'm going to send electricity through it. It'll get hot, like your blow dryer or your space heater. And I'm going to shadow project. I'm going to send some light past it. with this little spotlight thingy. You're okay. There we go. So let's turn it on and watch what happens to the air next to it. Can you see that? It's heating up the air next to it and it's going, the hot air wants to go up but you can tell there's air currents in the room blowing it. But mostly it's going up, not down. Can you guys see that okay? Give me some response. I can't look. I don't want to burn myself. <laughs> okay, good. That's convection. Heats up the air next to it. The hot air wants to rise and expand. Cold air comes in, heats up, and you get this convection cell. Transferring the heat around. Okay, as I unplug it, it takes longer to cool than it does to heat up, but you can see that the currents are lessening. Smell it. Yeah. Um, let's do some work. I'm going to put some dust particles in this bottle. They allow uh, vapor when it condenses to water. Gives them little particles to uh, do that on better. And then I'm going to seal it with a stopper and clamp it on here. Now it's sealed. 
I'm going to pump air into it and compress the air. Increase the density. And it gets, it gets turgid, rigid. But at some point, the pressure is going to be so great, it's going to pop the cork. I want you to watch the bottle, the water vapor inside. What happens to it? You ready? Can you see that? There's a little cloud inside, some water vapor mist. I increased the pressure, and that, that pushed on the air and compressed it, did work on it, caused it to turn into a vapor, any moisture that was in there. But when the pressure is released, there's a drop in pressure. That's like air going up in the atmosphere. There's less pressure up there, right? Air expands. When it expands, it loses temperature, doesn't it? Its temperature decreases because they're moving slower. They're running into slower particles as they move out. So its temperature drops and the vapor condensed. This was just a quicker way to do it. As soon as the, the cork popped out, the pressure dropped all at once. And so any water vapor in there expanded and condensed out back to the, the little cloud we saw. But there's, it's just energy transfer. Another fun one, who has a fireplace in their house? You know about the flu? You have to open something up top so that you can get convection flow. Let's do this one over here. Light another candle. So if you have a fire and a fireplace, that's not enough. The fire goes out. Why? No air. This is too tight. The hot air is rising, but no cold air can get in to replace it. It tries to go this way, but the hot air is pushing it out. And so there's no fresh oxygen down here to keep it lit, to burn. So what you do is you open the flue so it can go up and you leave it open here a little so fresh oxygen can get in. Here's a simple way to do it. Let's just divide it. Put a little divider in there. Now when you put it in, convection currents will set up. Hot air will end up going up one side, but now a cold, fresh oxygen could come in the other side. And it can replenish, keep itself going because of convection. Do you know why you get smoke at first when you're doing it? It's not hot enough. The hot air is not going up like you want it to. So the best way to do your fire is make sure both sides are open. And then try to burn stuff that will burn quickly and get the temperature up fast, like paper. That will start the convection going. Then you can build up the fire, and all your smoke will keep going up, not into your room. If, in this case, if you pull this out, it's like closing the flue or your doors. And again, hot air is trying to go up. Fresh oxygen is trying to come down, but it can't, and it goes out. And before it goes out, all that smoke's going into your room. <laughs> Another application. There's a good picture of this in your book, too. Uh, he draws better than I do. Let's see. You got some water and land. And let's say this is at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're at the ocean, right? You're on the beach. And you're standing here. Yay. Not in physics class. Let's say it's summer, day, and the sun's out. Why does the water not get up to as high a temperature? I heard it. Yeah, again, pss, pss, pss. louder, so I can tell you're really hit sync. Yeah, specific heat capacity is different. Who has higher? 
Specific heat capacity. The water. That means it resists change more. So it, it takes more radiant energy before it, has a, it changes its temperature as much. It can absorb more of that heat energy before it raises its temperature. So water is usually cooler than the surrounding land. The sand is really hot. Well, what does that do to the air above it? Yeah, it warms up the air here. And who gets hotter? The air above the land. So which way does it go? Up. So the cold air starts getting pulled in. And you get this convection flow. It's a sea breeze. That's why it feels cool on the beach, because the air above the, the ground, or the water, is being blown to you. And you can see it if you had a little campfire, or in the clouds, or a storm. The currents tend to move this way near land, and that way up high. But at night, what happens? I guess only one. <laughs> what happens at night? Who's going to cool down more? Well, good, the land does. So let's say it's 60 degrees. The water might cool down to 64. Again, more thermal inertia. This time, the current will go this way. The convection. Whoops. Because this is hotter. So it will rise up there. And you can see the currents blow that way again. That makes sense? All right, radiation, the last method. I have another one of these bulbs in this dish. I'm going to turn it on. And I'm going to suggest for your sanity, you move that way. <laughs> Not necessarily safety, just sanity. <laughs> so let's turn that on. I know all of you can't see it, but you know what happens. It heats up the air next to it, and that air rises, and it starts some convection. But that's not how it's going to heat up the match I have placed over here. It would take way too long and not enough heat. It'll go up. Sure, it'll warm this match eventually, but not enough. That's convection. It's not touching it either, so it's not conduction. It's radiation. It sends out electromagnetic waves. And these dishes focus those waves like light. It comes in this one, comes over here like this. And then that one focuses it onto the match head. And so as I'm stalling, the match head is absorbing heat energy from the lamp through what we call radiation. This isn't radioactive radiation. This is just you know, thermal radiation. Heat energy is being transferred from one thing to another without needing anything in between. Let's see if we can see any smoke on the match head yet. Yep. The match is starting to smoke. You'll know when it lights, hopefully. This is how uh, energy gets to us, Earth. Yeah. You can move back now. <laughs> I taped a firecracker to the match head because the match head lighting's fun, but you can't see it. You know when that goes. And yes, I have to go to Wyoming to get those. But it's for science. So, radiation. That is how energy gets to us from the sun. Let's turn this lamp on. This gets hot, but again, same idea. It doesn't need the air in between. It can just transfer radiant energy to this little bulb. I'll hold it up. No, I've got to hold still. We'll just put it there. So the veins in here don't turn much, but if I aim the light on it, they start spinning. It's called a radiometer. Radiometer. Radiant energy is being transferred to them. 
One side of the vein is black. The other side is white. We'll review this more Friday. Black is a better absorber of radiant energy. It's also a better emitter. You're, you're sort of familiar with this. Things that are, are like reflective, light bounces off of it. The white is reflective to thermal energy, and it kind of bounces off. Where the black absorbs it. Because it's black because it absorbs all the light. We don't see light come off of it. So it absorbs thermal energy too. It heats up. And then it heats up the air next to it. The little particles bounce off of it and have more energy. And they give it a kick. And the, the side that's black gets kicked more because it's hotter. And it rotates. If I turn it off, the black cools back down. And it slows down and eventually stops. But the energy is being trans transferred through radiation. Let's see, did I forget any of these while we're in here? Radiation. Waves. These are electromagnetic waves. They move along like this. They have an oscillating electric and magnetic field. That's why they're called electromagnetic waves. But they oscillate up and down and have a certain amount of energy associated with it. What I want you to know before we leave is one like this. This distance we call a wavelength. It's the distance before it repeats its pattern. Something with a smaller wavelength would look like this. As a, a, the wavelength shorter. Can you see that? But that means it's oscillating faster. We say it has a higher frequency. Gamma rays do have more frequency and shorter wavelengths than, say, visible light. And I'll review this more Friday. I just want to expose you to it now. The size of the waves matter. Anything that has a temperature, which means it's above absolute zero, right? That means its molecules have translational kinetic energy. They're moving. Anything that's moving like that gives off radiation in the form of an electromagnetic wave. If it has a higher temperature, those are moving faster, aren't they? They give off a higher frequency, shorter wavelength radiation. And if they're colder, they give off a longer wavelength, slower frequency, less energy wave. Does that make sense? And we'll see how that can be used, these three methods in radiation, for the remaining of Chapter 16 on Friday.